Okay. I'm uh, Tarn Adams. Uh, I work on uh, Dwarf Fortress with my brother Zach. And um, yeah, just uh, design all the systems together and uh, just a little fantasy world mm -hmm. generation game <laughs> settlement. <laughs> just a little. Hi, I'm David Dunham. I did a game called King of Dragon Pass as the lead designer and producer and programmer. And I did a sequel finally called Six Ages, which is out now on the App Store and coming soon to PCs. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, my name is Justin Ma. I am half of Subset Games. We made FTL and Faster, uh, Faster Than Light and Into the Breach, um, sort of systems focused like strategy and tactic style games mm -hmm. sci-fi um i do a lot i do all the art but I, I share the design work with matt cool. all right so to get started i'm going to go through and have each of our panelists uh, talk a little bit about the game they work on or games um just to give you some context for some of the things we'll be talking about uh, so let's hear about Dwarf Fortress first. All right, so uh, yeah, this is uh, <laughs> such as it is there. That's a, that's a uh, little dwarf colony with little happy faces running around. Basically a settlement management game with a ton of systems uh, in it that we've been working on for the last 17 years. And uh, the, the idea is basically that the player can indirectly uh, give sort of orders to these, these dwarves and uh, mm -hmm. And yes, yes, coming to Steam in, in some, oh, sorry. Uh, sometime next year but, yeah, <laughs> with, with new graphics and things so you can actually play it for once. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my apologies to most people in the room. But uh, the, uh, yeah, no, but it's, it's, I mean, it's just basically uh, the, the main idea is to uh, have enough systems banging together so that the player can, can have a story slowly form in their head uh, as they traverse the kind of mechanical uh, aspects of the of the game. Mm -hmm. And you want to talk a little bit about the Steam release and how it's done? Uh, yeah, so so sometime hopefully next year, uh, we've got our modders together. Uh, we got some of them to, um, you know, uh, help us make graphics for the game. Uh, and um, yeah, that's that's basically the, the the half the story. The rest is about usability. If everyone's ever tried to play this game, the interface is terrible. That little sidebar on the right is still a remnant of the former interface and. Uh, so things like mouse support, uh, possibly you know tutorials, that kind of thing, to actually help people, so they won't have to, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> ask everybody for help uh, all the time, just nice. most of the time instead. Nice, thanks. All right, thanks. David, why don't you tell us about your, your stuff? So uh, both of my games are basically uh, emergent narratives. A lot of people call them choose your own adventure games because you're faced with a whole series of choices like the one here, but that's actually not really true because behind that is an economic game where your decisions all have an impact on, in this case, showing clan relations. Uh, your relations with other clans are super important. How many cows you have is also extremely important. And uh, keeping your people happy in various ways, their mood will, will go up and down depending on what you do. Uh, as a structure, it's kind of an emergent narrative. We have an overall story we're trying to tell, but how you get there is different every time. The um, sort of design technique, I guess, is called uh, floating modules because each of those narrative pieces is largely standalone. It's not like a branching narrative. They are connected basically by the fact that they all tie into that social economic model. Cool, very nice. Yeah. Right, yeah, so this, uh, Tell yeah. us, you've got two games to show up here, so just give us an overview. Yeah, this was our first game, FTL. It's like a spaceship captain simulation, if you haven't heard of it. Um, it's much less on the simulation end than some of these games. It's more focused on minute small systems and the way they interact together, like something very basic like fire or oxygen and how those two interact. Um, practically speaking, you're exploring a uh, random-ish gal galaxy fighting pirates and stuff and trying not to explode or suffocate to death. Cool. And uh, yeah, our second game, which um, is currently on uh, PC and the Switch, is Into the Breach. It is a tactics game, very minimalistic, 
uh, we tried basically to see what it would be like to remove almost all randomness or output randomness from a game and just see what, how would that be interesting or fun. And it took us four years to figure it out, but uh, we're happy <laughs> with the result. Yes. Nice. Cool. All right. And Andy's got, I'm gonna show a video of, this is a game you're working on now, or yes. is out yeah. is out yet? No, not this yet. is not out yet. This right, is the game that we're uh, working on at Brace Yourself called Industries of Titan. All right, let's, let's do this. Welcome to the shipyard, founder. This is where you'll design your combat vessel. So uh, as you can clearly see, uh, <laughs> as you can clearly see, Industries of Titan is basically these three gentlemen's games in a single game. Uh, so we started off as making a city builder in which we wanted to have like simulated agents and the agents would kind of uh, sort of do their own thing. And if you, you would issue kind of orders or desires as a, as a player, sort of like you wanted to dismantle specific parts of the world or like build certain type of buildings and then your agents would respond to that. And then um, when we started discussing what we would do for combat, um, we obviously have direct, uh, inspiration from FTL where like, um, but taking sort of the city building aspect of it, we decided to make you build your own ships. And so you build the interiors like on a tile based way. And then you can use that ship make multiple versions of those and engage with other ships that are kind of generated and then disable them from like from the inside systemically just like uh, in FTL. And then one thing that we're trying to do with the game that um, or we're kind of like um, working on right now is this idea where you have like two types of agents. So the population layer is like a group of civilians that kind of behave on their own and they have their own desires and, and uh, schedules. So they can like, they'll like sleep, work and then spend their money. And you as a player don't have influence over that, but you provide, you have influence over the environment to give them sort of like the direction that you want them to have. And then there's another group of agents that you actually have direct control over and you tell them what to do specifically. And we're kind of, we're interested in seeing if we can make that like an interesting kind of uh, experience of kind of balancing these two systems. Nice, very cool. All right. So at any point during this panel, if you in the audience have a question about anything anyone says, please feel free to tweet it to this hashtag. Um, and if my, my phone has signal now, so uh, we will check, but I will periodically uh, keep track of that. So just feel free to, you know, pop one in, it'll be fine. All right, so to start, uh, I wanna talk about what systems design is, because there's a lot of different types of game design manifests in, in different ways, but uh, systems design is a little different from other types, like, you know, you hear a lot about level design or quest design or whatever. Uh, can you guys talk a little bit about what is systems design, what makes it different than other types of game design? Uh, <laughs> me? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess from, um, you know, there's systems in every type of game. In Mario, there's gravity, there's power-ups, there's everything, and they interact with each other. But I guess, so it's all a little bit vague of how you define these, but to me at least, um, systems-driven games are where you have these mechanics and it's on the player to figure out and interact with them and see how they work together and find out ways to use them versus on the game designer, like in a Mario or a level design driven game, where you're trying to set up a scenario for people to use them in a specific combo, it's more like we as the developer uh, uh, take a bunch of things and basically see, give it to the player and be like, all right, how, how would you use these? How can you um, make something fun out of this? And so very often the games end up being a little bit more playgroundy and I involve a lot of random uh, general mm -hmm. generation to uh, sort of encourage these this feeling of discovery in the player rather than just discovering what the designer intended you to see. But it doesn't have to be proc gen focused. Um, and uh, yeah, anyone want to continue? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, for, for us, we're, we're essentially using systems as a, as a proxy for things that exist in other games that we don't have the ability to create, like uh, stories and artwork and that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but, but, you know, as, 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 it's, it's, um, it's like that. I mean, as, as, as Justin said, I mean, you could consider chess a system-driven game in some sense, right? And that, that, uh, that, that it, 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 it's, it's, so, it is, so it is kind of vague in a sense, but in, it, we also all, I think, have a sort of sense of what we're talking about here, right? There's something going on underneath, there's kind of gears, it's either shown to the player or not, but you get, you get a sense that you're not sort of fully, um, you know, following, following someone's handwritten path. What are some games that y'all feel have good systems design or really systems driven that you like other than the ones you make? Um, you got mm -hmm. Oh, I was actually gonna talk about le things that are less systems design mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and more um, like a great fit for what they're doing. Um, there's a game, I guess it's morphed a lot, but one of the first social games I ever saw was the, called Packrat, and it was the first game that actually was more fun when more of your friends were playing because they'd set it up, you're going around stealing stuff and you could play totally fine by yourself. As you had more friends, you could steal from them. <laughs> you didn't interact directly with them, so it was it's still a great passive experience. You didn't have to coordinate or anything, but more friends made it better. Hmm. And there's a game called um, Spider that was an early iPhone game where it really felt like a great match for you're playing a spider by flicking and you jump. And just sort of making the, the game mechanic fit what you're doing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is kind of a rare thing. And it, Cool. Oh, well, yeah. I, can I talk about not my game, but like his? Yeah, you okay. can, sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, yeah, so I really like FTL, and I think what it did for me as someone who wanted to get better at game design was it made me realize that uh, there's a lot of stories out there that sort of exist as a fantasy. So, you know, as Justin will put it, being the captain of the Star Trek Enterprise, is it, it has existed in sort of form in television and whatnot for a long time. And so we as people understand what this means. And what it, what FTL did for me was made me realize that those stories are, they're sort of one permutation of a system that has already been existed. And so it made me, it kind of like opened up my eyes to the idea that systems are everywhere in this world and our whole world just operates on these things. I started looking at the real world, um, nature, uh, technology and whatnot from that lens, and it made me realize that game design is everywhere. And so, um, rather than saying like, I have a game that I really admire their systems, I started admiring the systems that just exist in front of us. I just was blind to it the whole time. But thanks, mm. Justin, <laughs> and, and Matt. <laughs> I think that's how we ended up coming up with a lot of our game design, at least me personally. Um, I just love to think about anything that exists and how it operates and is interconnected with other things. And I could, not that I would ever have time in my life, but you can make a game about literally anything. Like previously, my stupid idea of like, you can make a game about designing the air systems in a mall, like where you're trying to figure out how to move the air and keep things flowing. <laughs> and like people thought, you know, like that sounds stupid, but now you have, and now you have a, uh, Oxygen not included, which is basically that game. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you, could, you could take basically literally anything and just try and analyze how all the pieces work together um, and what, you know, then they have to reverse engineer why that would be interesting to do. Um, but I think a game that uh, has interesting systems design that's inspirational for me um, is Starseed Pilgrim um, because if you don't know it, it's like this little game where you have these random seeds and it's just, you put a seed down and it makes a block and the different seeds do different things and they sort of interact with each other. And uh, I'm a big fan of games that don't have hidden systems. So like, you, like everything is up front and it's super clear and then you can make an informed decision. That's just the type of games I generally gravitate towards. And Starseed Pilgrim is that, but it doesn't rely on existing things that we know. Like when we make FTL, it's easier to teach fire than to teach some weird space dust system that we that we have in the game. And so with Starseed Pilgrim, it's like, I know none of these mechanics and the game ends up being trying to figure out, wait, how does this world work? What are the systems in play here? And so the game is like a exploration in that way that I really enjoyed. 
And I think uh, in that vein is something like scribble knots, right? Where you know Justin was like, you could turn anything into a system. Well, you, you know, you take any object, and they're supposed to interact with each other in some way, and that's just sort of a monumental effort to like type two things into existence. And you know, how do you design that, right? It's just a, it's just a uh, kind of an amazing thing. And I think uh, in terms of like pointing out things that that maybe not as um, kind of sort of main mainstream, I'm not sure if that's the right word, is, as something like that is uh, look at interactive fiction, which is still, you know, out there today and has tons of people working on it. So so analogous to something like Scribblenauts would be something like Counterfeit Monkey, which has a sort of Scribblenauts type system, except there's things like, um, you know, anagram guns that you can turn things into other things just by flipping the letters and then they'll act like those things because Emily Short typed in, you know, 50,000 object definitions. <laughs> Um, and, and there's a ton of games like that out in interactive fiction uh, to look at if you want to see some really interesting systems driven stuff. So several of the audience questions uh, are about emergence and I feel like in systems driven game there's this quality of emergent behavior or emergent like interactivity that really shines. Um, so what uh, someone has asked, how do you find emergence in your systems interactions and if the systems aren't creating interesting emergent behavior, how do you figure out what sort of changes will enhance those behaviors and get there? Hmm. Not a trivial question. <laughs> <laughs> Some of my designs are intended to be emergent in a way because they're a little bit template driven. They, the um, interactive situations in Six Ages and King of Dragon Pass are intended to pick a random clan that comes to deal with you in whatever way. And it's emergence by whether that randomly picked clan is a friend or a foe. So your interaction is automatically different and gives it a context that the player gets to fill in with their own brain. So we don't have to do as nearly as much in the game. You know, your advisors will take note of that and remind you that these guys actually are fighting with us. Why are they coming to trade? Hmm. But this sort of, our template system may help a little bit with that. Yeah, I think that's the crux of it, is you just have to basically design mechanics with that in mind. You have to approach it from, um, this is something that's going to have to interact with everything else. And for us, at least, um, usually what that means is we have to make very simple things. And the actual system itself has to be almost uninterestingly simple. And But the problem is, as you make more, um, it gets expo exponentially more complicated. So if you go from three to four mechanics, that's maybe like twice as many like crazy corner cases that can happen. If you go from four to five, it's like game breaking. You can't do it. You know. So there's like a thin line of like how much complexity you can throw in there before you overwhelm yourself with like unintended consequences as I'm sure you're familiar with. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for us, when, when, we're, when we're choosing new systems, uh, you know, it, if, we're, if we're, we're trying to target emergence all the time, and the way that, that Zach and I would, would do this would be like literally to write down little story, story snippets that we wanted to see. You know, how do you, how do you know that you're gonna get people talking to each other and telling each other stories? Well, if you write down a little story and it requires these, these three things and you don't have one of those three things, then that story is literally not gonna happen, right? So you can just write some down and you, know, you have to be very careful about the kind of stories you write because if there's two people talking to each other and then suddenly you're in a, like a whole like natural language processing AI sort of situation that you really wanna step away from, but you'll get a feel for what you can do and, and, and what you can't do and be able to direct your, your, your systems to start producing uh, stories like this. And for us, when they do get too complicated, you can just kind of lean on the fact that it's still sort of funny. <laughs> <laughs> like if it totally screws up, as long as it doesn't crash and as long as the game kind of remains playable, then people will just kind of rationalize away, oh, these are just dwarves being dwarves. You know, <laughs> they, you know, even if they're just like doing handstands on tables, drinking and falling over and stuff, it's just, ah, oh, it's cool. You know, even if it was totally a mistake. <laughs> yeah, uh, so our approach is, is very similar to what Tarn said. It's, it's, we start, we have a very strong idea for what Titan's uh, player fantasy is. It's, it's dystopian, cyberpunk, hyper-capitalist future. And there's a lot of um, source material that kind of feeds into that, like Blade Runner or, or Acura. And we can look at sort of those narratives and then ask ourselves if, you know, if our core audience is someone who's a fan of those, those types of stories, are they able to fulfill those fantasies within our game or at least see those kind of 
occur uh, through the game systems, and if they don't, then we come up with a system that we can implement that will, that might cause that to occur. Um, mm -hmm. It's not like a one-to-one -one science, but at least it's like it feels like a step in that direction. And I feel like another important thing to remember is you rely a lot on the player to fill in the gaps as far as narrative and connection and story. Um, players will derive meaning from systems. I remember uh, a long time ago when Dan Cook was talking about Triple Town and the bears in Triple Town, uh, their movement is completely random, but players assign meaning and started to interpret that the bears were intentionally trying to sabotage them, even though the moving, it was, it was completely random number. So in that way, it's like, oh, just relying on a random number generator, but players are creating a narrative based on the context that systems happen in. So players get, that, that's part of the thing that makes systems design really exciting, I think, is how, seeing how players like fill in the, the blank space. Yeah, that's uh, something that we rely on extremely heavily. And um, with Into the Breach, um, we more intentionally design the story, I would think, around um, basically relying on the player to fill in all the gaps. But initially with FTL, it's but also it's just um, in part because we don't want to write that much, but in part because it's just Im impractical to convey all the stories that we want to. Um, we sort of set it up so that the, the, the narrative ends up being just what the player's experience is. And so that's something that you have to build into like the core, core game principle. You have to be very restrained with how much you um, put in detailed characters and, and stuff like that because you really do just want the player, at least for us, we want a, the player to come in with all of their knowledge and assumptions about sci-fi and you know, Star Trek and whatever, or if they love Battlestar Galactic or whatever, whatever you like, just take that and then this is that. Just whatever you want it to be, it's that. Um, and so it, I assume that can be similar with like Bright Blade Runner and stuff. Whatever your background is, just bring it to the game. And then if you can capitalize that by not having anything that's obviously against like a particular like perception, then it's way easier for players to get lost and just live in whatever space they want to. Mm -hmm. What is, speaking of emergent uh, behavior, who has some stories about uh, emergence that you didn't expect or your best or worst emergent outcome or something that a time where a system you were making did something completely unexpected for good or for ill? <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at you, Tarn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, the, the the funniest ones are just bugs, right? I mean, and that's and that's fine. Like like forgetting to initialize the temperature variable on rain, uh, <laughs> so that everyone caught on fire when it started raining, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, I I say it too much, so I hesitate to talk about the cats and the alcohol again. I'm sure a few of you have heard about that, right? The uh, the, the cats that walked into the tavern and walked through alcohol that the dwarves had spilled on the floor. But the bug report was just like, there are a bunch of dead cats and vomit in my tavern. <laughs> <laughs> and they had just been cleaning their paws, which I added because I added eyelids. It was very, you know, it's a long story <laughs> in this. But the only bug was that they would lick their paw and instead of transferring the actual size, I just wasn't thinking when I did in ingestion originally. It was just like, oh, just give them a whole mug. <laughs> and so it had the whole body size calculation, did the blood alcohol content for the cat, and it's like, you're in trouble, you know? <laughs> and, uh, so yes, respiratory failure followed, and it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of it was messed up, but. Uh, that, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that's, that's most of what it is for us, is just, just this kind of iterative process, and that also goes into like, just, you know, building players' stories and stuff. You're often in dialogue with your players when they tell the stories, you can see how to improve them, and just kind of, going in a circle like that, but I have other um, stories. Yeah, uh, we, when building FTL, for example, um, you know, we made it so that there's collisions, like between lasers and drones and asteroids and all those sorts of things, just specifically because it would happen uh, randomly at first, I guess, and it was just exciting that one time that the laser would hit uh, an asteroid or something. Although maybe we were planning something more with that, like actually targeting stuff and that fell through, but I don't remember at this point. But I do, um, we were talking about this, remember when the first time that people figured out that you can sort of manipulate the system so you can wait until an enemy drone is right before your lasers and time your shots. Or for example, you could turn off your 
um, your hacking drone mid-flight, which just stops it mid-air, which will dodge whatever shot is coming on, and then you turn it back on, and it gets past their sort of defense systems. And like all that was completely unintended, and um, is just sort of interesting outcome from just having these things be allowed to interact with each other. We like allowed these things to to you know have some sort of way to be damaging each other and that sort of stuff. So even if we don't, even if we don't intend it, like that's some of the most exciting stuff for us as developers because in part it just makes making the game more fun, um, where you can just. If you're not bored with it by the 10,000th hour of, of, of testing it, then that's like a, a good sign that it, you know you have an interesting dynamic systems from my point of view at least. Um, well, so um, before I was working on Industries of Titan, the first game I ever worked on was called Monaco. It's like a stealth, um, top-down stealth game for four players. And it's not as heavily systems driven as sort of the type of games that we're describing now. Uh, but uh, something that did happen was uh, we thought it would be funny if we made it so that all of the um, enemy NPCs would like occasionally need to use the restroom, and so they have like they have like a standard patrol, standard patrol path, and then like every now and then they go to the toilet, and when they use the toilet, it like actually like they like stand and pee into the toilet. Um, so one of the NPCs is actually a guard dog, and we didn't like differentiate that, <laughs> so the the dog can can use the restroom, and it looks like it's like just projecting its urine into the <laughs> toilet. <laughs> which, which would be awesome if that, if dogs could do that. <laughs> uh, so, how do you play test a system when you have stuff like this, where there's so many different outcomes that could you could create? How do you go about play testing like some of these heavy systems driven stuff? Some of what I do is to try to automate as much of it as possible. Um, I have uh, a system where I run through every response of every one of those interactive scenes, and you can't really tell if it makes logical sense to a human, but at least I can tell that it hasn't broken anything. <laughs> you know, I, I check to see if it's going to crash or something, because players will be in those situations. Um, hmm. we, we keep our stuff, like I was saying, our systems relatively constrained, and so, like, we just test heavily and heavily keep testing forever. Um, <laughs> very often what that means is you add one new thing and then you try, like one new mechanic, and try as many iterations of, you know, different layouts or different weapons on your mechs to try and see, to make sure it doesn't break everything. Like when you add the frozen units, like what, what does that mean? Um, the nice thing about doing it this way is you can sort of adapt based on what you find. So, you know, even if it wasn't intentional, if we find that you can use the frozen units to block the, um, you know, the emerging enemies in, into the breach, if that wasn't in, intended, then now we can reconsider the whole system around that as well as if that's a strategy and if that's something that we can do, maybe now we can encourage that. And that's not something that you can design, I think, if you rely on design documents to make your games, for example, uh, it's just a matter of approaching your own game itself as like someone else's work and, and being like ready to discover things and open-minded to, to just go with the flow. But then that also can lead to a lot of things being cut once they are terrible. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I literally don't have much to add to that, even in a game that has tons of systems that are more opaque. You test the code that you write to make sure that it's not, like, literally broken. You can stress test it a bit, and then you just have to play test. And we're not going to see all the cases. We rely a lot on the players just to kind of come back and tell us if something really strange is going on, and then we you know, decide whether or not it's funny enough to keep or <laughs> whether or not we want to actually redesign the systems to kind of future-proof things a little better um, and kind of move on into the into the future. But um, there really is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible at some point to pre-design pre everything, right? <laughs> just planning documents are uh, almost useless to us except for to kind of write down just some, some kind of... Uh, what might this system be related to in the future so we can refer back to it when we add it and try and connect up as much many links as possible and we're just going to miss stuff and it's fine. 
Oh, I'm so relieved that that's the case because like <laughs> uh, we just kind of throw like people at it and we like we just test manually and test and, and if something happens we fix it when it, when it happens but um, we get instances where like uh, you know our team is still small like our the internal Titan team is still small so we only catch so much and come before coming to PAX we were like uh, okay this game is pretty stable to play and it's been fine come take it to PAX and it immediately starts breaking all the time like one out of every two players and it's just like it's really difficult to do this in a in a way for, oh at least we, unless there's some secret that I'm unaware of like we just have to just throw bodies at it until we find all the problems at least that's how we're doing it for now uh, a good that's dear friend of mine um, Claude Jerome would t tell me like when working on destiny and trying to figure out exploits and anticipate like you know what players would do that it's like it's like trying to fence with a million people at the same time like you're trying to like outmaneuver like how people are going to like you can do that for a little bit but at the end of the day it's going to go out to the players and they're going to figure out something that you never anticipated and so it's just it's part of the nature of systems design i think yeah i think um just practically speaking when we try and test and try and break our own systems. It's a matter of just being like, putting yourself in the role of the player who does not want to do whatever you want them to do. <laughs> just whatever you want to do, they don't want to do that. Um, and so you just try everything possible to break your own game um, to just see, because you have a giant button that says end turn, things screaming at you saying, if the turn is over, what do you do? You hit the end turn button and like, People won't find that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here's a, an interesting question. Uh, is it easier to design roguelikes because players know that the expectation for success is low? And how do you determine the difficulty of your game when you have that kind of freedom? Oh, well, I guess I'm the more roguelike <laughs> of this group. Um, I think you kind of have to try to make the game that you want to make uh, and then let the game determine how hard it needs to be. Like um, FTL could be fun while being very hard. And it was, f for us, it, it was fun to lose. It was fun to be destroyed by, by fire while asteroids, you know, take out your shields and all that nonsense. Um, and so we just sort of rolled with it and we said, all right, if this, these are the most exciting experiences, then that's, you know, what, what we can design around. With Into the Breach, however, that game, was saying that um, A, being hard isn't really possible in that game because it it's a, almost a puzzle. You have to be able to solve it at some point. If you just add one more enemy, you go from challenging, interesting um, puzzle to just completely impossible to solve, and that's no fun. Um, and it also turned out to just kind of be fun when it was easy in general. Just sort of plowing through things with your giant mechs is more fun than surviving in, in FTL without issue. So I think a lot of it comes down to playing to your game and letting your game figure out what it needs to be. Uh, I can share an anecdote from my company since we had, since Necrodancer and Canes of Hyrule are both roguelikes. Um, I, I didn't work directly on those projects, but um, in talking to the team, uh, what they have expressed with regards to why they've chosen to make their game a roguelike is not necessarily the idea of like it being a way to have difficulty be part of the conversation. Really that um, when making a game, we can often spend many years making a game, three or onward more, and as developers, it's easy to sort of uh, lose the sort of uh, initial passion that we had for the project as we did in the beginning of the project. Um, but one of the things that they had observed in working on Necrodancer is that because it was a roguelike um, and they didn't know what to expect every time they went to play test it or even try the code that they had, the new features they added, it made them better at making the game more fun because they were, it maintained their desire every time they tried it. Yeah, um, that makes me want to ask David something actually. Just with our games, um, it's easy to add one mechanic and try it and say, is this game fun? Add one more mechanic and try it. Um, and then we can figure out how to make something interesting. And we are terrible at like trying to make a game that has a hundred moving parts that are all necessary, like Civ or something, where like it's not fun until everything is in there, until trading, until, you know, every, do you generally build things out sort of individual piece by piece systems wise, or do you just have to like make a little bit of everything and then try that? 
I think you have, we had to make a, a bit of everything to, you can't really tell, like, that's yeah. hard, <laughs> it's trading work. One of our advantages, perhaps, is that we're trying to be immersive in a way that you don't see the rules behind it. You don't technically see the systems, they're heavily implied. Your advisors will remind you how things work, but so if we have to like drop a system, perhaps mm. it could still, you don't know that. Yeah, that's simultaneous trying to make sure everything works before you can even test the game is like terrifying to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was kind of like had a strong concept and mm. seemed like it would work on paper. Paper, <laughs> paper prototyping can help with some of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, for us, it was uh, Dwarf Fortress was playable from the first day, but what it was was very different mm. from it was just like a digging and crafting game. It was like Dig Dug with workshops uh, and no opponents or anything, just kind of dig out a little map. And then we added another system and another system and just kind of steered the boat through it. And it was always kind of fun, but just very different uh, kind of, kind of fun. Um, and then eventually you feel like, someone else might think it's fun, right? And uh, it's, it's possible to, yeah, just kind of hang it together the whole time. Another thing I'm curious about, sorry. <laughs> but like, was there, was there anything like that you guys thought would be fun and you spent a really long time building a huge system and then you were like, this is terrible. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, the, 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 the biggest example I can think of, and this was a really terrible idea, was adding the kind of quartermaster dwarf to Dwarf Fortress, because we wanted this idea of dwarven autonomy, right? They act on, on their own, and the player has very kind of indirect influence over them, and so this comes to the idea of passing information around. You don't want to be able to instantaneously communicate to all of the dwarves, and so instead of doing something cool, which we're doing now, like um, having messengers in like a military situation where it, where it really affects a story if a messenger does or doesn't arrive, what we started with was, well, when you change the kind of equipment that people have, then a dwarf has to go and sit at the desk and say like, oh, you're gonna be wearing this now. Right, and it just slowed the game down way too much, and it's just not interesting if the quartermaster doesn't do the books, and then people don't have the right clothes on or something. It's just, it's, I mean, it can it can ultimately affect the outcome of the fortress, but it's not like this is a great story I'm going to tell all my friends. Uh, so we just scrapped it. We just cut it. Mm -hmm. uh, so one thing that we've sort of mentioned here and there is about uh, randomness and procedural generation, and I think a lot of players often conflate uh, systems design with proc gen, uh, but that's not necessarily, you know, they're not necessarily the same thing. So uh, who can, can you want to speak a little bit about like procedural generation, the role it plays in systems design, but how it's not, it's not always like required in a systemic game? Hmm. Or how it is, I don't know, what do you think? You could argue we don't procedurally generate at all because it's just sort of assembled as it goes, which is not quite the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, usually procedural generation will like, here's your, you know, randomize a level and, and then you go through and play it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tool like anything else and it can be useful when necessary. And, you know, for Into the Breach people assume that uh, all of our maps are procedurally generated, but we, those are actually all handcrafted with like minor tweaking here and there. And the reason is just because um, it's easier to get interesting uh, sort of situations by manually controlling like the placement of things. Um, and our options were to build an automated generative system that can make those maps with all those corner cases in mind or just do it by hand. And doing it by hand was faster. Um, so a lot of the time, you know, it, it's all just about what do you want you know, the end experience to be and what does procedural generation or hand crafting actually uh, aid in, in getting to you towards that goal. If I can jump back into our, our random scenes aren't really random in a way because they are often picked to be something that was appropriate and interesting for the situation. Again, it's not ahead of time, it's, it's how you play along and now you have a situation where, hey, this scene might work well. It's still probably picked from a random pool, but. I think one of the challenges with procedural generation that I often see uh, some devs run into is the assumption that it will make, it will make things interesting just because it's procedural, mm. but that's not always the case. Like it takes a lot of work and a long time to get 
a procedural system working for you, and if the end result, you aren't really gaining anything by it, then it's often like not the best solution. But sometimes, you know, sometimes that's how you get like the most interesting interactions out of your game. But sometimes the constraints that are required to make it work can make things result not that interesting. So it, like you said, it really is just one of many tools in a systems designer toolbox. Yeah, like you're saying, um, that just sounds like the thousand bowls of oatmeal problem, if you haven't heard of that, where you can like generate this every single bowl is a different placement of every piece of oatmeal and they have random sizes and differences, but then anyone who plays it is just like, yeah, it's just oatmeal. Like, <laughs> um, <laughs> so you, you, you have to generally be very careful about how you use it, like you're saying, and that's a lot of iteration and knowing exactly you know, how to make things fun, because you can have the coolest generated spaces and rooms and dungeons, but if it's not fun to play, then what's the point? Like, why, why even include it? Yeah, I mean, I'd say, um, and people bring up maps a lot, right? And a map is a core component of the game, and you really better get that right. But for us, take something like our Forgotten Beasts, which are randomly generated creatures, but they're edge, they're out in the fringes, right? So we can do almost anything we want with those. They come on the map and cause random trouble, but sometimes they're made out of glass and one hit kills them. Then that's still an interesting story because it, it doesn't destroy the game. It's just something cool that happened. And you know you can you can search for pictures of those and you'll find thousands of them. People you know really like that that system, but at the same time it wasn't dangerous for us to just play around and do whatever we want. Now we're finding that when you use this experimental stuff out on the fringes, you figure out what works. And now in the next version, we're going to have procedural humanoids that take a more core part of the game because of all the things we've learned, and uh, it's 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 you know it, it's it's looking promising so far. Uh, you know, so so that you can, you can really, yeah, just be just be mindful of what you're doing. Also, people are really bad at randomness. Mm -hmm. You'll have like I lost three times in a row, so it, the game must be cheating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, it just yeah. those bears, like those triple town bears, they're out to get you. <laughs> uh, I, my first uh, job as a designer was as a level designer, and I really liked that role because I would think of uh, when I was creating levels for players, I was trying to think of all the possible extreme cases that the game could, uh, the game system could allow for, and then create environments that like maximally showcase those cases. And so if that game was randomly generated instead, only a few people would be able to experience those edge cases rather, rather than the final product that we have now where it's like every single person can experience all those edge cases. But that doesn't mean that I feel like um, I prefer one or the other, because now we're working on Titan, it being um, procedurally generated, I think that one, the case for this one, is more that um, it, it, it feels like when I, when I play Titan, I feel like I'm trying, or well, at least the hope that I'm trying to give players is that like, they are entering a space that they've never seen before. And they can do that every time because it's, it's generated. And like, what I mean like, thematically is like, they're entering a new planet, right? They, they, like, they're the first ones to discover this planet. And I feel like that an authored space doesn't really help sell that, sell that idea or that fantasy. Nice. So here's an interesting question that's more on like the developer side. Uh, are there any programming or diagramming tools you use to map out system interconnections? Or do you have thought exercises you use to measure how a new system might be added? Like what sort of like the day to day when you're working and figuring out systems, what sort of tools or exercises or methods do you tend to use? Excel. Yeah. <laughs> Google Docs, yeah. Um, I think like for us at least, when I come up with a mechanic that I think is cool, like the first thing to do is think of like best case scenario, how can this be used like in a way that interacts with the other systems that's interesting. Um, and then if it gets past that barrier, then you think hard about what is every other system in the game and how could it interact with those? Um, and do any of these break? Um, and if, if so, then throw it out and don't even tell Matt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so if you get past that, I, I think you just have to implement it because um, there's no amount of imagination or even understanding your own game that can predict the way everything really works. Um, but you can try your best, but like to, to call away the worst, but yeah, testing. <laughs> yeah, I guess we chart out the few things that actually are branching um, and they tend, out, they tend to be nightmares, which is one reason we avoid it. 
because someone will always come in from a different way because it's not really a fully branching narrative. And we try to avoid those. <laughs> Yeah, I, I use spreadsheets and stuff too. I, I think I stay away from them typically though because um, I can spend a lot of time trying to make things perfect and then as soon as we implement a new system, all that just gets thrown out the window. <laughs> so I, rather now I'm just focusing on like implementing stuff and knowing that it's gonna maybe fix itself eventually or I, that's probably my job to do that eventually. Yeah, I feel like any sort of tools, like formal tools you use might be very early on. Like I'm a flowchart sort of person and you know, I might, you know, make a flow chart to sort of figure out like an overall system how it might work but like you don't you don't need Visio to do that you can use a pen and paper but just like the idea of how to make a flow chart um there was a talk at practice one year i think it was the year you gave the talk and someone gave this great talk about like sort of a visualization system they used for making systemic interactions, and I can't remember who it was or it what the talk Alicia. was. I think Alicia, maybe. Was it Alicia? Uh, she gave a systems talk, I don't know. Uh, yeah, they gave a really good talk about how they, they had the system of thinking about inputs and outputs, yeah. and like yeah. all the interactions in the game, like you know, what are the possible inputs to this, and what are the, how are they connected to outputs, and are you have any missing gaps, and it was, it was like a very advanced flowchart, but so there's some like formal methods for sort of thinking about this stuff, but it's really as a way to like get started and get you to a point where you can you can get something in the game and start like messing with it and working on it. I think I'm, I'm sure they have formalized methods in universities now teaching game design, but we kind of all miss that. I think like <laughs> that that was after our time to actually formalize these discussions. And even when I go to see the way they talk about it, sometimes it just confuses the heck out of me. Even though if I know like sort of what they're trying to say, but like the there are ways of discussing these very academically that is useful to some people. Mm -hmm, but, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, mean, I just came from a five-day academic conference and watched 50 presentations of papers on game design. And <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating stuff, but they really do have, the, they, their interests are somewhat aligned with ours mm. and <laughs> somewhat not. That's actually <laughs> interesting. Uh, so. Someone asked, how are the strategies about designing systems now different than they were one, five, or even 10 years ago? And it's hard to say when you're, when you're in, oops, it's fine, it's fine. When you're, in, when you're in your moment, like designing your stuff, it's hard, it can be hard to keep up with like how things are being taught or what, what things are, but if anything springs to mind. Um, my brother was telling me about how recent, in more recent years, um, just in general in the way that we're evaluating the world and analyzing things people have a more understanding of thinking about it systematically like you know thinking about economics from a systematic perspective or something like that um i could not tell you how it's <laughs> uh it's changed over time because because um my game design methodology is just i played a lot of games until i <laughs> can try and figure something out so um it seems like nowadays there's way more focus on on systems driven for consideration of almost everything. So I'm sure that's influencing game design too. All right, let's see here. Someone asked, um, how can a designer apply systemic design to other, to different genres like platform fighters, arcade games, et cetera, in order to allow for player expression? It's a very specific question. But I do think it's interesting to think about how maybe systems you've worked on in design and what genre, what genre might like have some application to a genre you hadn't thought about before. Uh, I see that a lot with the uh, narrative design, actually, uh, especially more recently. There's a lot of cool, interesting systemic things happening in, in narrative design, interactive fiction that seem pretty evolved. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that seems like a completely open-ended, interesting thing. It's like make a cool game that has new stuff is what that sounds like to me, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I guess you could do, it's just about making individual pieces of mechanics that can work with other mechanics. Like, you know, if you have a platformer and, you know, you make water, figure out some way for an enemy to act differently when it's near water or on water, in water, you know, just anything that can interact with each other and then just throw it, throw it all on, on the pile at once and see what happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. To some degree, when you think about achievements in a game, you're designing little sub goals <laughs> and I, I have players who try to like be completely pacifistic playing the game or completely warlike and it's not quite player expression, but 
to make sure the game can work with sort of totally divergent goals is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. maybe how you'd approach that. Uh, in the fighting game genre, which is a genre that I have a lot of experience playing prior to me being in the game industry, there are various forms of player expression within that that um, I don't know if I would say they're necessarily systems driven in the way that we're talking about now, but if the, if the goal of, let's say you as a designer was to make something that a player could express themselves in, um, at least in some of the more particularly complex fighting games, there are multiple avenues to solve the same problem. And um, ones, ones are more complicated than others. So I think players who feel like they as a player are more risk averse, they tend to take the simple, the simple avenue, which is, um, which is sort of like not entertaining to watch because when players watch that and they understand how the systems work, they, they understand that that particular player is a low risk player. And then there you have some of the more advanced players who achieve the exact same outcome taking a higher risk alternative and that excites the audience and then they get they start clapping and cheering and 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 that is only because those viewers understand that this particular player chose the more difficult path that yielded the same result it's, just, it's so that that is an example of player expression mm -hmm. um, and you can do stuff like that too if you like say hey, hey I'm going to make a game if you, let's say if you make a platformer and this particular platformer has a uh, a challenge that I want the player to solve you, have in your, you may, as a designer, have in your mind one way to solve that problem. So perhaps give, come up with like several different ways to solve the exact same problem. And so if a player, if a player, two, two different players stream it, then uh, you can see how those two players express themselves. And if that solution is not necessarily like solution A versus solution B, but they're like um, components. So like if you think about how a sentence is structured, like A, B, and C, or like a verb noun or whatever, if you can create it so that you have uh, um, parts that are sort of like interchangeable, like say, like I can use A, B, C, or I can use A, A, B to solve the same thing, then the combination of those parts kind of like will create um, like multiplicative ways to express yourself. You brought up streaming, and I think it is important to acknowledge uh, how making games that are watchable in, in this day and age is a very sort of different experience than making games used to be uh, and how systemic games sort of lend themselves to being watchable. Uh, so like for those of you like who've, you know, been around for a while, did, was anything about like the streaming revolution like exciting or insightful or did you see any difference in how your game is perceived when that sort of started or do you think about it when you make your games or anything like that? In some ways, I hate it because there's some plot twists in the game, and oh. I'd rather they not be revealed if you haven't played yet. But mm. yeah, the, the it seems more and more critical to be a, uh, to have a successful game to be able to be streamed well and have fans enjoy it. Um, and I don't think it's something that we as designers have figured out exactly how to actually make something that's good to stream. You can have all the pieces there, and sometimes it isn't, and sometimes it isn't. Um, I made had no assumptions, but um, going with Into the Breach, uh, it turned out to be way less potentially streamable than I had guessed, in part because um, there's so few actions that you take. You know, you take three actions per turn, basically, and that could take 10 minutes if someone's slow, and so you'll have streamers just screaming at the player for the, the obvious thing that they see um, that the streamer doesn't want to read through and have the, you know, the, all the viewers play for them. And so that wasn't something I, I predicted in terms of just being not very fun for a lot of people to stream. Um, it would, it's exciting to see the types of games that it pushes, but I hope it doesn't sort of restrict the games that are being made um, to things that are specifically for good for streaming, because that would just be kind of sad. That would reduce the amount mm -hmm. of variety overall, but it probably won't happen. <laughs> I, I agree that uh, I can't help but feel like uh, games that are they're more streamable, sort of they have this extra benefit of exposure that other games that don't that don't have don't succeed as well, and so it creates, it, it makes developers sort of shift their focus towards making these types of games, and so games that wouldn't be streamable sort of like would fall off popularity. But what I would say is, um, I think one of the things that I've sort of come to understand a little bit better is that uh, when, when streamer, um, I mean, when people watch streamers, they're watching the human, not the game, and so the content that 
if you if your goal as a designer or like if you're trying to make a systems driven game is to get people to stream it then the content that's generated has to incite like some sort of reaction within the streamer and that's why i think systems driven games are like they lend themselves to be youtube really well because then you the um these uh content creators they make like montages of like their most extreme reactions to the most bizarre stories or busting out laughing and whatnot mm -hmm. lots of surprises yeah yeah, yeah. that sort of thing well, we have uh, only have a few minutes left, so I want to uh, close off by having everyone, you know, give a systems design insight or, or something that that you feel like you've learned from your work, or you know, just some some adage to mm. depart the audience with <laughs> wisdom on demand. <laughs> uh, I guess one thing. Um, you don't have to have really good AI to have uh, generated stories. Like the AI in both of our games is very simple. And in FTL, for example, we were particularly surprised the first time we implemented it. And then we saw, I mean, it will be a simple rule. Like um, if health is this low, go to the med bay. If it's not, go fight fires. And then so you get these weird little situations where they'll get hurt trying to fight a fire and go heal and then go back and fight the fire. and that. It felt very human, yet it's just like two rules. You know, you can you can do a lot with a little. I think. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna say that cognitive biases will bite you, even if you know there are cognitive biases and what they are. Mm. Uh, we had particularly like mood changes in the game, or something that oh this makes sense that people will be happy. They'll add five to mood or something, and that totally makes sense in the context of one little situation. But when the game lasts 50 years and you have now. A hundred of these, like moods off the chart, and it's kind of useful. Like, oh, I lost five mood. Who the hell cares? So, you really have to pay attention to sort of cumulative behavior and, and think outside your narrow time frames. And it's kind of why we have climate change and oceans polluted because we don't think that way. Humans mm -hmm. don't work like that. But. Yeah, I mean, just generally speaking, keeping in mind that you have a player is harder to do sometimes when you're working on systems-driven games because you get really into how the pieces move around and you might want to model you know, all 50 variables on a tire in a racing game and so forth. And it's important not to go too deep uh, into your systems when you make them. Just make it just enough that you've got enough grease to get the stories flowing and think of how they're perceived. Uh, a lot of what we do uh, is thinking about exposition, right? How do, how do I summarize this information, get the player to see it, uh, so that they'll understand what's going on, because if they don't, if they don't understand what happened, they don't need to understand the systems at all. I mean, it's, it's obviously different perspectives based on different games, but for us, they don't need to understand the systems at all. But they need to understand that something happened and that it kind of made sense. Uh, but if you don't think about that, if you get into your design documents and stuff, you'll just have a game that's completely un unplayable. Uh, so this is just a personal um, a, a pr uh, preference, but I think that there's within the simulation, there's like. Uh, there's like a spectrum of what you can expose to the player and what you don't. Justin's kind of expressed that he prefers games where the whole thing is exposed, and that's amazing because that because because from our approach, it, our approach is more like um, there's certain elements that we don't expose, and and we can kind of use that as a way of maintaining like the mystery of the game because I think there's a group of players who are really passionate about these types of games and they want to understand like the 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 thing that makes them excited about it is learning what's in the black box. And so we've kind of leveraged that to benefit us in a way that it makes it so that it's a lot harder to expose everything and also make it like still be interesting. So like hats off to you for approaching that, but like we kind of like keep our things kind of um, working in the background for the most part and only expose the bits that like we, we want players to kind of like interact with. All right, well, that's all the time we have for us. So thank you so much for your questions. There's some we didn't get to, but maybe our panelists might check Twitter later and answer them, no? But let's give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your packs.